A dream I'd had that night came back to me. In it, Jonathan Dante was rowing a boat alone. Tara's tits made me think of the dream, the boat. I was swimming alongside as he rowed. The great ocean was calm and clear, and only my father and I were present. From time to time, I looked over at him, but he never acknowledged me, and he never stopped rowing. It was a repeating dream. I'd had it over and over for years. It usually ended with him rowing away and disappearing in the boat. It was the first time I'd had the dream since Dante died. This time, I was alone in the water. Dante was gone. That we were both in the boat. At the end of his life, we were both. Uh, everything, it was amazing that all the shit between us was healed. That there was nothing but good feelings between me and my father at the end. Nothing but good feelings. And it's wonderful because we had such a lousy relationship when I was a kid. But when I got older, I mean into manhood, uh, it got much better, much better. Death as it shook you, you gave it And the uh, postscript here is, John Fonte died in the Motion Picture Hospital in Los Angeles on May 8th, 1983. He was 74 years old. Give me It's wonderful for me to be here because uh, Potenza is the town of, the, of my grandmother's birth. So to me, it's a pilgrimage. For 20 years, I was uh, an alcoholic uh, and very crazy. Per vent'anni sono stato un alcolizzato e quindi ho avuto un comportamento um, abbastanza um, fuori di me, era molto fuori di me. And from that comes a kind of desperation um, that you either die from or survive. E da quell'esperienza viene un tipo di disperazione um, per la quale, da, attraverso la quale o si muore oppure si sopravvive a questo tipo di disperazione. What he didn't know is that I know desperate too and crazy and what emptiness and aloneness and rage can do when you've got nothing but your own pain in your pockets and your home is a busted out 1978 Pontiac stalled in an alley in West LA and the voice in your mind is carving more of you up and killing more of you off each day and you wake up and drink more rat piss wine to keep you from instant madness and God becomes a guy coming out of the 7-Eleven handing you chump change toward another fucking jug and fear is your finest feeling and love is dead and all time is dead and even your teeth stink and your gut is bloated with the screaming voices of those you hate and the only real sanity there is can be found in the small miracle of sucking back one more drink. That mean white cat didn't know that I've been cut too from the same cloth. The only difference between us is 10 years and my typewriter. My name is Dan Fonte. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I'm an American writer. Genetically, I come from an oral tradition. 
my grandfather was a storyteller in Abruzzi. And my grandfather hang out in bars and tell stories with his friends. And he would tell my father stories. And my father, I would hear my father tell stories. And it, so it really is, uh, my father was the first one to commit the oral tradition to, to paper. But all we are is storytellers, the three of us, we're just storytellers. This is today. This was 100 years ago, my grandfather's city in Italy. These are the nicest people in the world. They are just like my family, you know? Let's see. The picture of my, my mother's 80th birthday, so nine years ago. My brother who died, my younger brother, my, my older brother's wife, myself, my sister, my mother, my first granddaughter. This is, she's six, I guess seven years ago. Huh? She's a baby. She was baptized. My son and uh, his wife. I keep pictures behind pictures. Ah, who's that? René Ferré. For some reason, like I said, I keep pictures behind pictures. So it's very interesting what we'll find. It could be an adventure. Uh, let's see. But I want to find that picture of my ex-wife. Let's see. Uh, this is not my ex-wife. She looks, they look very close. They're like twins. I'll show you. In the bookstore, they put my name on the marquee of the movie theater. You see? I did a reading with a friend of mine. So you see? The studio, huh? And this is the uh, movie star right there. Nice, I like it. Okay. I'm going to find this picture of my... Ah, there she is. Shit. So I found it. <laughs> well, the, it's not a good picture. I think, and I was heavier, too. Well, it's a good picture of her. She was cute. Okay, that didn't work. I'll try it again. Okay. This is like surgery. It's like brain surgery. It will not be as good as new, but it will be functional. Voila! My father was an enormous influence on me. Not he, but his writing. His words on paper were a model of excellence. And Bukowski was an influence, too. I was reading Bukowski at the time, and his poetry was something freeing for me. I gave myself permission, and so I began to write, and, and out of it, there began to be a theme that was coherent, and I pursued that theme, and in a year, I had maybe 250 pages. They weren't very good, but they were 250 pages, and uh, out of that came Chump Change. I've worked very hard to get my style down. My style is, if, uh, 
if writers like John Updike and uh, John Grisham are cappuccino, my style is espresso. And uh, the difference is I don't want any violins and I don't want any birds flying and I don't want any musical uh, comedy in the background. I keep my objective is to keep each sentence short and have punch. I'm a, a, I'm a, I write fiction. I write, uh, I write what I hope to be an honest depiction of emotion. The emotions are what's important to me. The emotions are 100% honest. The madness is 100% honest. The, uh, uh, Bukowski, if he said it was his 90% uh, uh, truth, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it uh, because uh, or, or if you're a slave to a recording events, then it's biographical, um, and uh, uh, then it's not. Then it is no longer a novel. It's bi It's biography. Um, I it does that doesn't work for me. So there's a, a high percentage of uh, of what happened to me in within the books. But um, no, I, it, it would be um, it would be dishonest for me to say that. I'm trying to find this fucking bookstore, and uh, I think I've lost it now. Let me see. Uh, no parking, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. That means that's okay. No parking any time, except two-hour parking. 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Fridays. I have no idea. I think it's okay. I think this is okay. Jesus, God. I'm trying to remember it. John Fonte visited me again this morning. Uh, he came to me behind my eyes. And he was standing behind my chair. And I felt him. And I turned, I closed my eyes and I felt his presence. And I said to uh, this ghost, I can't remember the goddamn poem. I can't remember the goddamn poem. Okay, uh, I have to, uh, I'll do it for you in the car. That's right. How you doing? Uh, oh, very good. Very good. Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we go. So you would have a chewing gum, would you? What? A chewing gum? 
it was 10 years ago, and they didn't have any John Fonte titles. Um, and so uh, now they have 10 John Fonte titles. And uh, so I went into the, I remember going in there for the first time and speaking to the owner and, uh, and saying, uh, you know, my dad was a, <laughs> I, used to, I used to pimp my father's literature uh, when I first started writing. And the reason I did it was because he was a local LA writer and I wanted people to read his stuff. And so I went in there. Uh, this is one of the bookstores I went into. And I asked, uh, would you guys please carry John Fonte? Because he's an LA writer. And they hadn't heard from him at that time. And uh, the good news is, it's 2002. And, uh, and they have about 10 of my old man's titles. now. <laughs> Now we got to get them to get more of my tiles. They have one of my books in there, and uh, uh, and I would really like it if they would uh, if they would carry more of my stuff. Oh. Try to remember that poem. This morning, John, John Fonte came to me this morning he was be, he was standing behind me as I was writing. His warm breath, I felt his warm breath on my neck. And when I shut my eyes, I could see him at his writing table in Malibu, banging out Tommy Gunn words on his old typewriter. And I felt an ancient but familiar pain. I called out to him. When I quit working at um, telemarketing jobs and the limo, uh, limousine service, uh, and started to write books, my mother became very angry with me. Uh, because she thought I was wasting my time. She felt it was uh, stupid, useless. But she did not want any more, <laughs> any more writers in the family. 
she did not like my books. She said it was garbage, junk, because she was managing my father's books and uh, all his uh, literary business. And she felt, I think she felt that my writing uh, was uh, somehow competition, you know, somehow, uh, I, I don't know, that she, uh, she wanted to keep me away from all of it. So she did. So for many years, uh, we did not speak to each other, my mother and I. Now, to these days, it's different. When you're away and I'm home, squeezing the day to get full, I recognize with my. furniture and all the books and everything uh, but was still I still had a memory of my father but um, but now that there is no furniture in the house now that uh, it is vacant it's uh, I remember it but it's not the same you know it's, I don't, it doesn't have the feeling of my father anymore, or my family. My mother uh, lived in the house for 50 years but while my father was alive, every year he tried to sell the house. Every year, every year. Always the sign was up for sale. It's very funny. My mother was suicidal when she was pregnant with me, and my father was in a, in a terrible uh, psychological place. He was drinking a lot, and uh, my father was prone to rages, and uh, so he would rage and uh, scream, and, and my mo he and my mother were not getting along, and he wouldn't come to the hospital when I was born, and etc. So that, uh, it's an interesting memory. Uh, uh, some of it is a memory, uh, but certainly I know that I was very upset uh, as an infant and, uh, and almost died uh, several times in the first few months of my life. I couldn't keep food. I couldn't retain any food. I was, I was rejecting all the food that I was getting. So, uh, That's because there was no dust jacket. October 10th, 1938. <laughs> well, I don't know what that oh my gosh. Do you have a tattoo? Though? Oh, thank you. Did you still read a lot? Are you still reading a lot? Oh, yeah. How many books a week? Oh, I don't know. Six. St no, come on. Really? Sure. What do you do with all your books? Well, I recirculate them. No, but you don't have space. Remember that? <laughs> we 
Yeah. You remember the garage in uh, in your house? Yeah. There's a. Um, there was no space left in the garage because of all the books you read. And I got rid of a lot of them, too. I, when I read uh, Jump Change, um, I think shortly thereafter I had uh, dinner with Dan. And uh, uh, I, you know, I, I enjoyed the book, but the passage which loosely referred to me was uh, something, you know, I didn't think uh, captured me at all. So we talked about it, and uh, um, Dan said the same thing that he's saying now, you know, he, it's, uh, it's fiction, so. Uh. The character that I used of you, he was uh, like a guy who was going to get an MBA, and he had, ever, he had his mind focused on, on, you know, uh, on knowing everything, and he knew all the stock options, and he knew what yeah. people should be doing and all that stuff, you know. Uh, the, the, what I liked about it, <laughs> my favorite part, actually in the book, and writing it was my favorite, was the, the timing of the drive from the, the house in Malibu to Cedar sinai and they, uh, d there's, a, there's a scene where the cars are stopped and you have to turn left and they and they and finally this guy he's lo he's not getting his time so he has to swoop around the the traffic and and make a turn you know honestly okay because it's it, it, in the beginning you write because you have something to say no no i was being so no because obviously you stand up there too because you want to say something but obviously you'd like people to get out and read your book so you want to sell it so people and if you're up there talking then maybe people will take an interest in what you're saying and buy your book i got that Vicky, evans read my stuff and uh and works for rolling stone magazine and uh and so has some kinds of I guess, points of view on my work. I mean, the first book starts off, not to put it crudely, but if I recall right, the first paragraph is, you know, he says, like, I'm not gay, but I was in a porno theater, and, like, uh, some guy sucked me off, you know, and or it was something like that. It was fucking some guy. And, um, you know, that's a great beginning to a book of someone who's very conflicted, and to me that sort of captures, you know, this moment in America. I write first-person narrative. And that's, that's the problem. The problem is that publishers don't want to publish first-person narrative. Interestingly enough, the French and the Italians uh, and the Germans love first-person narrative. You know, but the other, on the other hand, um, memoirs are hot, you know, and so it's like your books are sort of novelistic, but in the first person, is that what you're saying? Yeah, but first-person narrative has been, that was my father's problem. This is the L.A. Times. Did you see this article? Yeah, he saw it. Okay. And then uh, two weeks ago, Los Angeles Times bestseller list, fiction section. My father was number 15. The week before, he'd been number 13. I, but the funny thing is, like, in, I think it's, I don't know if it's in Chump Change more, but... You know, where the fictionalized character of your dad appears, what's funny is that you always go out of your way to to sort of pay your respects to him. Oh. And uh, at least, you know, as a reader who, like, I have no, you know, interest in family matters, you know, just reading the book as a reader the first time before I really knew you at all, um, I was, like, amazed. God, this guy is so respectful toward his father, and he's actually taken his dad into his book and to sort of write a, you know, to write a letter to him, you know, or saying, you know, how I respect you. And, and like, he went out of his way. Like, he, you know, he didn't have to do this. And it's kind of funny then to hear later on, like, well, he's, you know, the daddy dearest thing or something like that. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, whether, whoever your father is, if it's part of your story that you want to pay this respect to yeah. him in your writing, you know, who gives a fuck whether he's famous or, you know, not, or, or almost. I've known this mile so long. <laughs> yeah. well, we'll yeah. you know, I mean, but, it, you know, Dad, we're, there are five generations of alcoholics. Yeah, I know. As with most families. Well, yeah, but so you get my kid, who's got it, me who had it, Dad who had it, 
dad's father who had it and dad's father's father. One morning I woke up and it occurred to me that in the funeral of my brother, nobody mentioned that he had the same disease that I have. That he was an alcoholic. That he was an alcoholic. Not long, Jim. Uh oh, that was. Uh... One or two times in my life do I remember seeing Dad drink. I mean, he'd have a glass of wine at dinner, but I he'd never. He'd drink and he'd get nasty. You well, know, he'd start insulting right. people. Right. But did we? But how often did we see him get drunk? No, very. No. Never. Not very often. Maybe twice in my life. So you know, it's such a it's such a contrast to where he was um, years earlier with you and and Nick. So we grew up a whole different, um, in a whole different environment. Oh yeah. Than Dan and Nick. It is, I knew, Nick was still drinking just by seeing him that oh, day. Oh yeah. But I had absolutely no idea what to do about it. Well, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, but, you know, if he'd called and said, you know what, here's the deal. I'm, I'm up here in Auburn and. I'm drinking myself to death, maybe somebody should know, then maybe we could have, you know, gone, gone up there and, and, and done something. But, uh, you know, they don't make it an announcement. He just... No, Jim, see, that's my point. The point is, in a, in a family with a drunk like that, somebody who's dying of alcoholism, there's a code of silence where everybody, where the wife supports the, the code of silence. Nobody talks about this decomposing corpse in the, in the living room. What they do is they, they make excuses about it. They say, well, he quit. Or, but the woman who, who was his secretary said after he had that transfusion the year before and lost all that blood, that he, three weeks out of the hospital he was drinking a quart a day. And nobody, I mean, Sharon would ignore it. She just ignored it. Yeah. And he, you know, so ignored it in the sense that she knew it was going on, but she didn't tell anybody. He didn't tell anybody. So there's an and to the outside world, they protected the secret. The first time I had a, a, a spiritual experience was when I got drunk when I was five. And, uh, and I remember, it's fascinating, because my mother was with an artist, a sculptor, and they were drinking beer at noon in her living room in Los Angeles. And they were drinking it out of pewter steins with long pewter handles. And uh, they left the room, and I drank both their beers. And I remember standing up and banging my head on the bottom of the piano. So I was four or five at the time. And it was the first time I felt free. Uh, he is 20 years younger than me. We are 20 years and... One week apart. So I was a little boy when he was born. He had to put up with a lot of shit from me. This kid. Life has been difficult for him. I lived in New York when he was a little boy. My father used to take him to baseball games and to the movies and, you know, these, those things. This poem is for my son, Jeffrey. Walk with only words and books as your friend. Dream the dreams of deviant dead writers, saints, 
who coming before you drown the pain of their purest heart in vats of gin like a flailing unloved cat. Jeffrey, Vicky, are you there? Hello. 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 I'm at the door. Embrace selfishness and joblessness. Smoke millions of unfiltered cigarettes and glue your ass hopelessly to the evilest drunken crack whore who trades your balls in a New York instant for the guy at the end of the bar with a pitted face and a $50 bill. Do not be courageous. Remember that all men are fools and liars soulless captives of their own blood-stained necessity and forgive nothing my son then maybe one day like me your feet aching and your skull still raw from last night's festivity you'll kick over a box or turn a page and find yourself face to face with the blurry eyes of god I was with my friend, and one night we were drunk. In I was working uh, in an amusement park in uh, Ocean Park, and we decided to go to New York. And so we stayed up all night, and we began to hitchhike. The first man who stopped drove us 2,000 miles. And then we didn't stop. We switched driving. So there was no stopping. And we slept in the car. And uh, so we did 2,000 miles in, I don't know, uh, a day and a half or two days. And uh, in a very short time, then we got stuck in, um, yeah, in the rain, it was raining. And then we got two more rides and we were in all the way in uh, New Jersey, which is next to New York. So we got three rides in total, all the way across country. It was fantastic. And, uh, but I had many jobs in between, many jobs. Uh, one of my favorites was, uh, as it talks about in Spitting Off Tall Buildings, was the movie theater job. But the problem with that job was we would see the movie over and over and over again. So I was working with a guy and we would drink on the job and we made a game. We knew all the dialogue of the actors and we would say the dialogue just before the actors would say it and the people were furious <laughs> so uh, basically what I was was a, a cab driver in New York and a street peddler and uh, so many other things uh, a movie usher uh, uh, a carnival barker uh, a dishwasher clerical uh, assistant, a window washer, a uh, gas station attendant. Uh, I can't even, you know, telemarketer, uh, uh, security guard. Uh, Still no guy.
It's not a generous world. After he handed me the book, the clerk walked away. Over his shoulder, he called, if you want it, it's $29.95. Only original Dante paperback I've ever had. Very rare. It was unpretentious and light in my hand. When I opened it, the spine crackled. The pages were hard and dry. This was all that was left of my father. I began to read about the Mexican girl and her sandals and the young broke writer wanting to impress her to fall in love, spilling the coffee on the table top over the nickel he had left there. Page after page, each line read like the singing of a high Latin mass. The honesty was as painful as I remembered. My father's strong, exposed heart was everywhere. This novel was Dante's masterpiece, written before the fat screenwriting paychecks from Hollywood had turned him into a par golfer and a bitter old shit. I wanted to yell out, to share this, to make sure another living person would know this writer who'd fashioned the experience on these pages, the greatness of this work. If his books were being read, I'd be doing something for my father. I think the best definition of American writer, of an American writer, uh, there's a, uh, I think a tradition uh, beginning with the beat writers, no, beginning uh, before that, beginning with Sherwood Anderson in Winesburg, Ohio, and, and, uh, and Nathaniel West in uh, Day of the Locust, uh, Ask the Dust by John Fonte. There's a tradition of Western writers, a kind of a tradition of uh, self-discovery. And then through the beats, through Kerouac, who of course was not a Western writer, but uh, there's a kind of a, a new experience. Oh, and I mustn't certainly mustn't forget Steinbeck. Um, I'm living my dream. I am my dream. My dream was to be a writer. Uh, and to stay alive. I'm doing both. Los Angeles in the distance, maybe half a mile away. That road stretches 200 miles to Los Angeles. We are halfway between Las Vegas and Los Angeles. This is the hill, or a hill like it, where Arturo Bandini walked to the top and threw a copy of his book into the desert. You see it? Where Camila Lopez walked with her dog into that desert. Amazing, huh? So, uh, for me, the desert is the source of inspiration, is the source of, uh, of a relationship between me and who I am spiritually. 
I think it, I can only talk about myself. Uh, the obligation I feel as a writer is to explore my experience and relate that in such a way that it has an impact, that it can, people can identify with it and it can expand their perception of who they are. By reading my work, hopefully they will see themselves in it. And then as a writer, I've done my job, you know? No more than that. The rest of it is bullshit. The rest of it about philosophy and about uh, intellectuality and all of that stuff uh, that writers talk about, especially uh, American writers, uh, is just nonsense. Uh, it, all it is is my experience. All it is is a gift to give something back, uh, to reach out, to make contact, to be tactile, to say, here's something for you. Jump change. The galleys. This is for so that. Okay. Now, you ready? You're t yeah, okay. Okay. I'm going to show you this red box that was in his garage with uh, two or three hundred sheets of paper in it. The first draft, no, this is the second draft. This is the first draft of Chump Change. Uh, oh, look, 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 here. The, I began. 1991. That's the date I began and finished on 8691. So that was seven months. And, uh, uh, but that's only the first draft. The uh, Chump Change took me three years to write. That when I was writing Chump Change, I didn't, hadn't decided uh, to write a book. Uh, I decided to write something on a typewriter, maybe a short story or something like that. And what happened for me is I went into the garage of my father's house in Malibu and in an old box that uh, I just started for one afternoon I was going through boxes and I found a ream which is 500 sheets of this paper. Actually, I found half a ream, about, about 200 sheets. And this is legal typing paper. My father wrote his last novel, uh, Brotherhood of the Grape, on the same paper uh, in 
1977, and I used the paper to write the first draft of my novel. Now let's see what else we got. Look at your face. 